All right, so we want to make this webinar so interactive. So I would entreat all members to put their questions in the chat box. If you would want to voice it out to you, you can raise your hand and we'll be given the opportunity to talk. So to start with, I would like to let you know our panelists, then we'll take it over from there. So our first panelist is a geographic information science professional with a background in geology and has an interest in applying technology in geoscience endeavors. Had both her bachelor's and master's in geology and GIS from Eastern Illinois University. And she is in, um, she is the person of Ms. Shelley Mensa. Thank you, Ms. Shelley, for joining us. And our second panelist is a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Nebraska Center for Science, Mathematics, and Computer Education. He is passionate about supporting underrepresented and underserved minority students. He obtained his PhD from Montana State University, focusing on mathematics and mathematics education. So help me welcome Dr. Emmanuel Batson Odro. And moving on, Dr. Ni Ama Okain is an assistant professor at Mathematical Sciences Department at Appalachian State University. He obtained his master's degree from Illinois State University and PhD in business from the University of Wisconsin Madison. His area of research focuses on micro level reserving rate making, micro insurance, and machine learning. So Dr. Ni Amorokai, you're so welcome. And the fourth panelist is Mr. Daniel Ba, who is a trained environmental and sustainability scientist who has transitioned into a career in healthcare. He obtained his bachelor's in environmental science from University of Cape Coast and proceeded to having a master's degree in environmental science at Rochester Institute of Technology. He also works as immigration paralegal and has assisted lots of African students with their green card filings. And the fifth and our final panelist is the CEO of Ampadu and Associates, who practices corporate and immigration law. He got a Bachelor's of Law from Mount Crest University in Ghana and a Bachelor's degree in Philosophy and Religious and Religions from University of Ghana. He, he also obtained a Master of Law degree from University of Connecticut and a postdoctoral graduate, sorry, a postgraduate diploma in legal practice from Rwanda. He currently works with an energy company here in the state as a consultant on contracts and risk mitigation. So members help me welcome Mr. Elvis Ampedu. So having said all this, I would want to give our panelists the opportunity to um, introduce themselves. As I've already said, I gave a brief intro of them, so we would want to know exactly who they are. So in no particular order, as we have just a lady amongst them, I would want the lady to go first. So Miss Shelley, you can start. Sorry, I had to drop off a bit. Um, am I just introducing myself? Or, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so I'm Shirley Mensa. I'm from... Ghana. I have been in the United States since 2015. I came here to pursue my bachelor's degree and then um, went on to also complete my master's and um, I've been on OPT so far. Thank you. So the rest of our panel members can take over. Anyone can go. Okay, so uh, just as Lydia said, my name is Daniel Adidiba. Uh, I hold double masters in environmental science and also sustainability. And uh, currently, I work in healthcare and also do paralegal and immigration stuffs. 
I am an, uh, let me say, a veteran PAD. When I say veteran PAD, I left a PAD program, so I'm a veteran, a veteran <laughs> PAD, but I love what I do, like concerning immigration stuff and other things, and I'm hoping to interact with a lot of you here. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Neil Kain. Uh, can you hear me? Sure, we can. Yeah, my name is Neil Kain. Um, uh, as you said, I'm an assistant professor at Appalachian State University. Uh, this is my third year in the, uh, uh, since I graduated from the PhD program, and uh, we recently got our green card. So I guess I can also speak to that. Um, yeah, uh, I have two kids and uh, my wife. Yeah, um, Imano, uh, I came to the States in 2017. Um, my background has been in math and math education. Um, I have a lovely wife and I have two lovely kids. Um, currently, I'm a postdoc, I guess. Um, in August, I'll be transitioning as a tenure track assistant professor at Perry University. Um, more recently, I found success with um, the EB1 Extraordinary Ability as well as the EB2 National Interest. I guess I may speak with some of these things, but yeah, I'm hoping to learn from all of you and share some ideas. Awesome. It looks like our fifth panelist is yet to join. So as and when he joins, I will give him the opportunity to let him talk to us too. So to kick start, as graduate students, our ultimate goal is to excel academ acad academically in our chosen career path. But then a big question comes to focus as to what next we're going to do right after graduate school. Um, a lot of us kind of get stuck, get confused based on um, information or what they've seen. So to get into it, we would want to know from our panelists, what are some of the possible pathways after graduate school and how we graduate students should prepare to embrace these pathways. So anyone can start, but I would always wish that um, Shelly Stashins, <laughs> she's the lady amongst the mayor. Thank you. Okay, um, so from my knowledge, some pathways that you can take um, if you do want to keep staying in the United States is, um, the good old uh, sponsorship that we know from companies all the time. And um, also the part that I went through, I didn't mention that I also have my green card. Yeah. Um, so for me, I went through the EBT NIW, which is one of the ways that um, international students can definitely explore. Also the EB1. Yeah. So those are the two that I usually like to mention for international students. Okay, so any of our panelists can take over. Okay, so uh, to add a bit to what Shelley said, I see as an international student, uh, one thing you have to take note of is that the moment you land in any port of entry, you better start thinking of how, or let's say what comes after your program. Uh, most of us, we don't ask ourselves that question probably because we are so much carried over by the kind of scenery of the country or trying to visit places. But I'll use myself as an example. Uh, like I was saying, I came here to study for master's in environmental science uh, on get, get fund scholarships. So I was fully funded. But I'm somebody who was also, also very inquisitive. So I used to read immigration news a lot, which is a lot of things you'll be doing as international students, especially under President Trump era. Any uh, a letter of an immigration news is actually something which gives you a heartbeat. So uh, that is something you take note of. So as an international student, what I'll tell you is that after school, don't wait till after school. Once you land in a port of entry, ask yourself after my program, what next? If I had asked myself that question, probably I wouldn't have suffered the way I suffered 
through my program after school because I studied environmental science. And let's be honest, this was the time of President Trump where companies don't care about whatever they do with the environment because uh, Trump wasn't that much an environmental enthusiast, let me put it that way. So it was very difficult getting OPT, therefore I have to re-enroll in a PhD program. Whether I love the program or research, I didn't love it. That is something that is left for another day for discussion. But uh, if I have asked myself that question, I would have thought about after school, what next? And naturally built my profile to that. And who knows, maybe uh, my profile could also have landed me some other opportunity that I really so much desire. So ask yourself this question right now. If you don't actually have that question, ask yourself, what am I going to do after school? Uh, don't wait until after you are getting close to the end of your program before you ask this question. Thank you. Yeah, and I totally agree with what uh, Daniel said. Uh, I think, well, for me, uh, the goal after uh, graduate school was to, you know, get a job, right? Um, I mean, I came into the master's program, um, um, then I got the offered into the PhD program, but it's always to, to get a job, right? Um, the, what he said is true. It starts when you enter into the program. Uh, every move you make uh, whilst you're a student leads to, you know, uh, that goal, right? So your performance in classes, your connections, your uh, conferences you go, uh, the connections you create, internship, you know, uh, publications, or to be geared towards uh, trying to uh, be successful in the in the job market. So uh, what we are trying to say is it's not only the last year that you start thinking about, okay, what well, I'm, I'm going to do. It's actually start right when you start uh, the program. Everything, Everything you do will lead to that kind of uh, um will help you be successful in that. So you shouldn't take anything lightly. Uh, you have to plan. Uh, you have to make sure, of course, you're doing good in class, but also you have to create connections. Uh, that's where the internships and stuff comes in. Um, and one thing that I think people underestimate is when you move into another country, you know, there are certain ways things are done, right? Uh, I had a mentor who, you know, kind of advised me that when I was in the master's program, uh, it was like trying, uh, I mean, in, try and get share a room with an American, right? I didn't really understand that until, uh, you know, some years back uh, or some years later. Uh, it's important to kind of understand how they think and all that, right? And that's why, so, you know, I went to, I was in a master's program where there, there were a lot of Ghanaians. So sometimes we can just, you know, get ourselves and just be in our own, you know, in our own comfort zone. But sometimes you have to move across and try to understand how people think, how people, how Americans think, how they, they act to certain situations and stuff like that. And I guess that was what my advisor was trying to, uh, I mean, my mentor was trying to help me get right try to get used to the system and in that kind of way so all those kind of relationships and all that uh, of course doing well in class uh, helps you to prepare to uh, that goal right and if you do everything right at the end of the in your last year you find everything uh, not too challenging right because you've brought up a lot of profile uh, that will help you uh, to achieve that goal Well, I think um, everyone has said almost everything that I had in mind, um, but I'll add a couple of things, and that would be that this discussion of what do you want to do after school begins uh, right from when you begin, because like you are not afforded with a lot of luxury. Like um, for example, immigration is going to be tough on you. Applying things with USCIS is going to be time bound, right? So everything that you want to do after school should be that you're on top of your game. You know what it means to interview for positions if you want to go in for a work option. And also, you know what it really means to uh, like even answer some of these questions, build confidence, right? Uh, sometimes uh, 
there will be conversations that like um, Neil kind said that would go out start talking about and be things that are really you may not have known while you were in Ghana and these are all corporate conversations that could help you if you move in through that direction so I guess um, everything should be right from when you begin start looking out for uh, what you want to do and it should be more of like something earlier than later I found something more useful by reaching out to people who have been successful, right? And I always say this, that if you want to learn alone from your mistakes, you're not going to have all the time in the world. So you should learn from other people, right? So um, get to LinkedIn, get to people that you want to be, send them a message, tell them that you want to have a chat with them. Sometimes they may be around you in your school pay for like a lunch, talk to them, get some of the conversations that you would otherwise not just get anywhere. And then you can start off from there as well. But like, I can't care with most of the things they've said as well. All right, this session has been very interesting and informative. So um, when Dr. Ni Okain was talking, he made mention of getting a job after school, um get an internship so um have said that this takes us to our next question which is what are the ways to navigate the job market because um sometimes before um not necessarily before but um in applying for a job what job seekers um these employers look out for is experience and as we international students um Per what I have heard, I tend to be corrected if that's true, that um, the experiences we have back home that we bring here really don't count. So they really want to see the experience you've had here. So um, in navigating the job market, how can the graduate student strategically navigate the job market? And what happens if um, you don't get an internship is there a possibility of getting a job without having an internship with a company? And we um, would like to have a brief discussion on CPT and OPT too. So if our panelists can do us the honors in that area too. Thank you. I guess I'll start as always. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, so I'm speaking more from um, the perspective of someone uh, in the STEM field. So this has been my experience where um, I would say when it comes to job search, networking is really big. Um, I know it's kind of like, it's not something we're really used to back home. Um, I'm talking about Ghana, but yeah, we're all from Ghana. <laughs> I forgot. So um, networking is one of the key things in the United States if you want a job, that's what I've realized. And for international students, I would say that while you're in school, um, if you get the opportunity to do an internship, please go for it because like um, Lydia mentioned, the companies want to see the experience that you have in the United States, not so much the experience you've had in Ghana. So if you're able to get an internship, some of these internships before you even um, finish it up, the companies can choose to take you on full time. So when you graduate, they let you come back to be a full time worker. So if you have the opportunity for an internship, please go for it. But if that doesn't happen, the whole networking part, going for your schools, um, let's say um, on campus visit days with companies to meet prospective employers, that also really helps. That way you can create more um, relationships with people in the industry and then um, creating more networks that way you can be even uh, recommended by someone that knows you on campus to a company and one other resource that has been really helpful for me I would say is LinkedIn also big on networking knowing how to reach out to recruiters online because I know reaching out to strangers might be intimidating but when it comes to LinkedIn just knowing how to send like a message on there talking to recruiters also really helps Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so to add a bit to what Shelly said, uh, it's very true, uh, LinkedIn. Actually, I underestimated the power of LinkedIn uh, when I was in grad school. Not until after I got my green card that even some of the jobs I got, LinkedIn helped me to get it because there were people in my circles that 
I guess that at the mention of just uh, telling them that, oh, I need a job. I don't even have to go through interview. They just get me connected to the director of whatever it is. And I got a job in healthcare and other areas. So that's the power of LinkedIn. Uh, another thing I also want to talk about have to do with something that we always kind of overlook uh, coming from Ghana is certification. America, I don't know for whatever reason, they rely on certifications a lot. I always ask myself, so besides the kind of all the knowledge we got from school, is it that they don't trust school or they don't trust our credentials even from their own universities? But I've come to realize that even to do even, even a minor job here it requires some form of certification. So ask yourself right now, in your field that you are pursuing, what are some of the industry certifications in your field that you can do? Uh, I remember when I was in my PhD program, one guy was in there with, uh, he was beside school, always study for certification. And I was like, dude, what are you doing with all these certifications? He's like, I need it. And trust me, it's going to help me. And today I know that the certifications that he pursued really paid off because he's really moving very fast in his career. So look around, research your field. For instance, you may be an environmental scientist, but you also have to get maybe a certified environmental science professional certification. Because without having that one on your resume, put the recruiter at ease and know that you have been tried and tested. And this is something that we don't know. We don't mostly do from Ghana, like I said, because you, you finish uh, your university education, you start putting your CVs, going to offices, trying to look for a job. Uh, nobody actually talk about certifications to you, unless maybe you are in the IT field, maybe that may be a bit different. So please, please do that research about certifications. Americans love certifications a lot. I cannot kind of hate it enough. They really love it. So that is one thing I also want to add, beside the network and I shall talk about. Yeah, um, I feel uh, to to do well in the job market, right? Again, it starts from the beginning, right? You have to know what you want to do. Do you want to be in, uh, a professor? Do you want to be in the industry? I feel uh, the requirements in these two areas can be a little bit different. For example, if you want to be in academia, uh, you, you should do a, lo a little bit more research, right? You should have research page pairs and stuff like that. So if in the beginning, you already know, okay, I mean, I came to the master's program. I came in the US for the master's program, but whilst I was in the master's program, I knew I wanted to do pursue the PhD, right? So in the first year, uh, you know, usually with the master's, it's two years, right? So in your first summer, you should get an internship uh, because it's important. I mean, it helps. It's not, it's not like a deal breaker, but it helps, right? So, I, if I really wanted to be uh, going to the job market, then my focus would have been on getting a, an internship. But, uh, truthfully, I knew that I really wanted to get into the PhD program. So, even though I didn't really, I, I tried to get an internship. Um, I didn't get one in the in the summer of my first year, um, I actually actually ended up working well for me because I used that summer to work on research. And that actually, that paper ended up uh, getting me an award, which helped me get into the a, a scholarship into the uh, PhD program, right? So in the PhD, the idea is to, you know, uh, create new ideas, right? Master's program is, okay, we, you are going to master this, the uh, knowledge already around. PhD is, okay, what can you do to improve the knowledge that's already there? So the focus more is about, you know, research papers and stuff like that. So if you want to be in academia, then you have to work on uh, getting publications and stuff like that. And I also feel in academia, your relationship with your advisor is very important, right? Uh, they, they can make or break you, right? I mean, of course, you have to pray you get somebody you can work with well. But you, you cannot underestimate the importance of relationship with your advisor and also going to conferences. That wouldn't really matter if you are, you want to go to the uh, industry. For the industry, I mean, I mean, I'm an actuarial professor. For actuarial science, our students need uh, actuarial certifications. You don't have to get a certification while you, whilst you're in school. You just have to have some of the exams, right? Typically. We are talking about probability and financial mathematics. Mm -hmm. So if you are, I always advise my students, try to get uh, these two exams, at least one before you, you get into your third year, right? Mm -hmm. if, you are, if you get one, you can get, it will be easier for you to get an internship in the summer of, uh, at the end of the third year, 
then you go to the internship, you do well, the companies, of course, it's an investment taking you uh, for the internship. It's an investment. So they really want to keep you at the end of the internship, right? So that's the part you want to go if you really want to go to the uh, uh, industry. So it's something you have to decide. And that's why I would say start from right when you enter the program. What do you want for yourself? Uh, what, do you, what do you want for yourself? Doctor, can you please, you are muted. Oh, mm -hmm. so everything I was saying was on mute? No, it's just for a second. Oh, okay. Um, I mean, Lydia, you said something about um, uh, the experience from Ghana. And I'm going to say every experience counts, right? Experience mm -hmm. from Ghana, experience from everywhere. The problem I see with Ghanaian students is, you know, our culture, our culture is very... Uh, you know, we don't talk back to elders. And I'm, I'm always trying to challenge that, right? Uh, that kind of timidity, uh, please, everything. The culture here is different. It's like, I'm going to tell you what you need to hear and that's it, right? And for Ghanaian students, when they come in, they are, oh, please, you know, a big culture shock for me was when I was in the master's program and I see students raising their left hand and things, you know, but that's the culture here we don't we don't talk back and i always try to advise people and i'm going to say it here today if you're a Ghanaian student and you want to be successful here learn how to be bold learn how to be brag a little bit sometimes we tend to you know uh, kind of uh, what's the word uh, be a little bit uh, moderate no all your experiences from ghana are important brag about it in fact, I'm not going to say lie, but try to make it like don't don't underestimate your experience you go in Ghana. It's always important. It's all about how you interview, how you present yourself. I'm not going to tell you to lie, but I'm going to tell you to be bold in how you kind of present yourself. You know, sometimes people make. I see comments on social media. You see some of this food from the restaurants here. And they give it big, big names. But back home, our local food, Gary, something, you know, our boy, you know, we need to have better names. And that's the marketing. It's all about marketing, right? So market yourself better. Like try to be a little bit more uh, bold and stuff like that. Uh, I, I guess I, I'll stop for you. I'll stop here. Uh, later on, we can talk about OPT and CPT. Well, um... The luxury of being the last person to talk means that most people say what I would say, so that's good. Um, but one thing that um, wasn't mentioned that I think it's really important is um, the resume, right? Your CV, especially if you are preparing to enter into the industry aspect. And I think this is uh, equally important for the academia, but more really important for the industry guys, right? Most of times, it, um, the AIs are the ones that are screening the first set of um, resumes. So um, the, you, are, you are not getting human beings to literally look at this CV. Sometimes they get like 1,000. Sometimes they get like 500. You don't expect a human being to be going through all these 500. So they have AIs. So what I want you to be aware of is that your CV really should speak for you. And what that means is that you look at the job description, and you, you have to make sure that you are embedding some of these skills within your CV. So that at least when AI screens the first set of CV, you can move to the point where a human being finally sees you, right? Because until you get to that point, then of course it means that you are almost likely not to be moving to the next point. So when you are preparing CVs, I know that sometimes you are tempted to just like um, make a very generic one. But if you really want a job, then you have to put in a lot of effort. And that means that you take the time, prepare CVs that are tethered towards job description so that when the AIs are screening your resumes, then you are most likely to be moved into the next set of candidates who would likely meet uh, maybe the talent acquisition team before next you move to the hiring manager. So I would like to say that the preparation of your resume is really, really important. And while you do all the networking, 
if this is not solid, sometimes it can go against you. And um, or we also on the line of um, internship, right? One thing is that, let's say you did a very solid job of um, preparing a good CV. So you get through the AI screen, you get through the human being a part where finally you are given an opportunity to interview for a job, right? The next point is um, a lot have been said, like for example, um, confidence and all of those things, which I always uh, go for it. Another area that is really important is like, how are you embedding the missions and the, how are you making the interview about them, right? I know interview is usually about you, that's agreed upon, but it has to be, what is it about them that makes you think that you are the one um, uh, suitable for the job, right? So for, for example, like maybe why, um, why Milliman, right? Like there are a lot of companies you may have applied to. Why did you apply to Milliman, right? Sometimes the way and manner you answer some of these questions can really strike them in a way that makes you so unique that you could easily move through, regardless of maybe the networks that you may already have um, in those places. So one thing that I think is really important if you are preparing for internship is that you have to make sure that your CV is solid that it is uh, matching the job descriptions that um, are, are being posted. And then when you get to the interview aspect, you really should prepare very well about um, selling yourself as well as uh, making the, the job very important, right? And how your uh, skills match closely with this um, job descriptions as well. Okay. so. <clears throat> we'll take questions from the audience. I saw Doreen raise her hand. Mm -hmm. She had a question, Doreen. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, everyone. My name is Doreen, and I'm the social media coordinator of the organization. I want to know if, um, from your various submissions, does your thesis or your dissertation guarantee, like, you a job? Because sometimes you may find yourself, like, doing something that maybe was your interest but then at the end of the day at the end of fifth year or at the end of second year master's degree you end up having an interest in working in the company because of various reasons so i want to know if any um, job interviewer is interested in knowing exactly what went on in your thesis or dissertation or basically they're looking at what you've acquired over the years as a skill or expertise okay so i want to comment on this one yeah so of course, yeah, this is very much important, especially for those in STEM fields and those in research-based uh, programs. Uh, whenever you are doing a research, it may not be directly a technology transfer to what the company is looking for, but we call something uh, job-related skills, okay? So, for instance, uh, those in PAD knows, like, your ability to search for articles, do literature reviews, your ability to search for information itself is a skill that uh, every employer would like really to have, uh, have uh, want to see on your resume. So for instance, what made in my case, when I was doing my master's, I was treating wastewater with microalgae. And luckily for me, it was a research that a company was going to use to scale up to treat their wastewater uh, in somewhere around New York. So you realize that when through that, you were able to occasionally go on the site to actually set up systems for the company and actually do a kind of small miniature st uh, stuff of treatment systems on the company. And it helps in the networking process. It helps the company it's, it to actually know our skills. What we do so that when you go for some of these interviews, they really know you even before you start. So research is very important. And one thing I also say is about your research advisor. You, your research advisor can also play a very key role. For instance, if you wanted some internship, your research advisors, though they are not that much uh, pro industry, they are academia, but they may have some connections. Remember, time they get some of these fundings from industries to research on certain things, and they can recommend you as a student to some of these companies. So, of course, yes, the research you choose can equally help you to learn something. Your research supervisor can help you to learn something. So. Keep, uh, like uh, uh, Doc said, keep a close contact with them, keep a cordial relationship with them, and make sure that uh, you are always step closer to them. Let them know your, your what you want. At times, they don't assume that they know. That's a, one mistake that we do that, oh, my research advisor knows that I need a job. Uh, they may not know because here yeah, you can't assume for people in the United States, you can't even suggest for your child unless you open up and talk to them. At times, knock on their doors. They have opened up policies. 
knock on their door and discuss with them. And you know, you may be very much surprised as to the kind of links they can get for you to actually land these internships. Um, I think um, Dan has said uh, much. Um, I would like to also bring out some important things. Uh, Doreen, there is nothing as um, what you've done is useless or is not directly related to whatever you're going to do in the future. One thing that I will emphasize is that one, you can decide to let them know what information you want to share, right? If you don't put that project on your resume, no one is going to know that you did that particular project. That is not to say don't put that uh, project on. But I think one thing that is very useful in life, like regardless of immigration, being a student, is that um, what you have attracts um, the, the things around you, right? The reason why I was called today was not because I'm a Ghanaian. Um, I mean, it's part of it, but there are so many Ghanaians. You called me today because you felt that I was very important in the discussions that you wanted to have. That is how you have to make your recruiters feel so you want this job you look at the job description you go back to yourself what are the things that i've done and this is not just about dissertation it could be some coursework you've done some projects you've done it could even be readings you've done make sure that everything about the cv is attractive right in a way that they want you sell yourself so that they need you right so it, it's not about just saying the whole thing about your thesis and not being related hurts you know. Project the aspect of your experiences that align closely with the job so that when a, a, a recruiter sees you, it's like, wow, this is the person we are looking for. So nothing is useless. It depends on how you sell yourself. For example, Daniel said something about you are in a PhD program, your ability to search for uh, literature review and all of those things, right? You can highlight that as a skill, right? Um, it, it, it all depends on how you sell yourself. So there is nothing as though like if your thesis or your project is not directly related to the job description, then it means that you are no go, right? You can share something you've read and it could be in a form of you did it as while you studied your program. It could be experiences you've gathered and all of those things. So I would say that whatever you are selling on your CV, it should be something that the job description needs, because if not, then um, my words may be harsh, but then you are not needed for the job. So make sure that um, whatever you put on your CV, because most of the questions may be something around projects on your CVs or experiences you've shared. So whatever you put on your CV, let it tether with the job description. So this is not to lowball your thesis, but you could even put components of your thesis within the CV that strengthens your candidacy in the job application. Thank you. Dr. Kang, you adding something? Um, I mean, uh, they've said everything. I, I guess uh, what uh, Imano said is true, you know, if you speak class, it's always good. Uh, but uh, in addition to everything everybody has said, I want to mention the uh, importance of mock interviews, especially for uh, people or graduate students who are in uh, their year to experience uh, job interviews in the US, right? It's very important. Try to get somebody, your somebody, your mentor, somebody you like, you respect, try to let them grow you, sit down 30 minutes with them, go through that process. And uh, trust me, it will do you a whole lot of good. And you don't want to do certain mistakes during the real interview. So let that mock interview save all the, all the unnecessary things away from you and only leave the ones that are good for the interview. All right, thank you. So I think someone that she also has a question. Can you unmute yourself and ask a question? Yes, and thank you very much. Um, my question is related to Doreen's question, and I appreciate Dr. Drew for um, the input, but I have a follow-up. So um, 
we always talk about internships and then it is good for you to get the experience. Um, also, you realize I'm a civil engineering PhD student and you realize in engineering, a lot of professors use summer to work on several projects. And some of these projects are projects that fund your, your, your program. And it's not just a project, more like a research. These are projects that gives you hands-on experience. These are projects from industry, like we said, from a particular company you work on. So it's more like equally the same experience you get when you go into the industry, or if you are supposed to take an internship in the industry, because you may be with a research office over there, equally doing the same thing you are doing with your professor during the summer. So do you classify this as a hands-on experience on your CV? My question is done. Yes, uh, it's a hands-on. Uh, one, the only difference is that you are looking at somebody who have gone for internship in a corporate America compared to somebody who is doing this in academia. You know, one thing that, like you said, you're a PhD student. PhD, ninety percent of the time, prepare people to actually do research in academia, probably, and mostly doing some of this uh, summer research. Uh, it's a way of also building your uh, a, a academic profile and uh, Google Scholar profile, let me put it that, because some of this will be publishable. And through it, you can also get certain skills, you know, certain hard skills uh, that even somebody in the corporate world may not actually have gotten. I tell you that I have a lot of PhD friends and the kind of hard skills that they have, uh, if they're able to list it, you realize that you in the corporate world, you are not even getting, let's say, even 70% of it. They really do a lot of stuff, trust me. So don't underrate that opportunity at all. Take opportunity, uh, take, take advantage of that uh, summer research and get that experience. It's equally good. And you see America here, one thing I always say is that it's about packaging. Uh, you don't necessarily have to experience uh, explain it that, oh, it was a summer research internship that you did. Yeah, you know, people package stuff on their resume. Uh, I like a term one of my clients uses, he said packaging. Well, nice <laughs> so you have to package yourself, though it's a summer research, but what did you get? What hard skills did you get? What communication skills did you get? What presentation skills did you get? Okay, what technology were you able to use? And what was even your findings? How does it apply to the bigger corporate world? You need industries need information to actually apply. So whatever we study in academia, there's a pl application aspect in industry. So that is the linkage you have to draw on your CV. This thing I did can actually, in bigger sense, can be scaled up in industry and help your company do this or help your company do that. So please don't underrate it. Just take advantage of it and you're going to be fine. An example um, to stress a little bit on what Dan is saying. So, Imano, have you um, looked at um, about million set of data have you extracted some data from it or oh, oh, not quite that however i can say for sure that as a research assistant with this consulting unit i worked closely to look at some data that were around maybe fifty thousand sets of data i did a lot of um, extraction transforming and loading of these data management from um, multiple sources and i can say that while well, that will not probably match the 11 million data sets that maybe Sintin compression have are, are as equally as likely to apply these skills as they won't be as different as possible, right? It's, so this is me telling you that, hey, I haven't done it, but I don't want to just say I haven't done it, that you are shutting it down. I have done something which is equally very important to the things that you want and I can easily pull it out. So back to the conversation, it's how you package during the times of Daniel. It's how you package your experiences. And I don't want to say blow it up, but don't be so nice about it either. Like, um, make it big. Like, don't, let, let me tell you an example. The first time I spoke with my advisor, I, I told him that in a brief sentence, describe what you do. Well, he was like, I'm into software and I do this and I, Jack, do you know what the guy is actually doing? He's sending text messages to people. And they, I was like, what? Like, so that is what you do. Like in the Ghanaian term, that is all you are doing. But the way he spoke about the thing and I was blown off, right? That is how you have to speak about your, your experiences. I always say that those who are in the lab, 
they have a lot of advantages. Why? Because, because sometimes you are funded by um, a lot of projects. You, 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 dumble, you dumble a lot with a lot of different projects. Most of these guys, for example, would end up in somewhere like Intel and then Verizon and all of those things. But it is because of certain projects they may have helped with, right? So you are going for a job interview and you are seeing some connections between some project that may not even be your final dissertation, right? but you've worked on it in some different capacity. Blow that capacity and highlight it to them. That's Jack, this is what. And it's not that you are blowing it. You did it. I have experience. I'm showing it to you. It's, in your mind, it may be like, oh, this is not my real dissertation. But you have some experience. And Jack, we need that experience. So bring that this experience. And then I know somebody who got a job in Transamerica just because he read a certain literature on a certain paper. This is not a paper he did. He did just the literature he once read. He highlighted that as an experience that he has. And that was the only reason why he got the job because they really wanted expertise in that area. So there is nothing quote unquote useless. Highlight the things that are really strong and then push it to them so that um, you become a center of attraction. Just like if you have a magnet and you put it close to a metal, it will stick. Find that attraction in the job put it on your CV and then blow it. That is why sometimes I feel like applying for jobs in the industry is as difficult because changing and tweaking your CVs is a whole lot gain in general. But if you want it, it's, it's best you do that. Okay. Yeah, I, I, guess, um, okay. I guess a lot of the said, uh, what I want to add is, Recently, uh, I mean, uh, being being an assistant professor, I've been on the on a hiring committee, right? And now, like, I kind of feel different about interviewing. Sometimes, in, I mean, you get to some level at, of interview, we know you can do the job, right? We know you have the technical skills and all that. It gets to a point, I just want to like you, right? And that you cannot underestimate that uh, when you get to a certain level, of, I mean, sometimes the initial levels, you have to show that you can do your job, but maybe you've gone through all that then maybe you have the final interview on, uh, on, on the, uh, we call it on campus visit, but in the industry, you go, you go to the company, you want the people to like you, right? So there are certain soft skills and all that you also need to master. It's not always the technical skills, also the soft skills, right? Uh, what they call it, the, the emotional intelligence part of things and all that, right? So I also want to urge you guys to also try to, I mean, there are a lot of ways to improve on your emotional intelligence and your soft skills. And, and that's another discussion, but you can read about it and see how you can improve that. Okay, so I can see two questions posted in the chat box. So since there are two, I'm going to share it um, amongst the panelists to take one and um, the other two to handle the rest. So the first is for those yet to enter the US, what kind of skills should we possess even before we start our graduate studies? And the now... second is, Okay, yeah, so I'll I say this, I was going to do first with this one, but please go ahead. <laughs> you know what? Um, the second question actually is directed to you because the first person uh, mentioned your oh, name I specifically. See. Yes. And the second question is, so, hello, Dr. Okine. Can you help us with some expected questions that cuts across interviews and how do we provide answers? Well, uh, the, the first one, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm happy that that question was asked, right? So let me give you an, uh, a real life situation, right? A friend of mine, very smart dude, right? He was my mm -hmm. roommate in the master's program. And, you know, we did regression and stuff in Ghana, right? And, mm -hmm. you know, our first year, we were looking, you know, usually uh, the internship, People, companies start interviewing for internship around September, November, right? For the next summer, right? So we've come in fresh, you know, 
you know, we, we are smart guys, you know, like we've done regression classes, you know, in, in, in I mean, I don't want to hit on Oregon University, so let me use, uh, okay, actually, he went to tech and I went to UCC, so maybe it's a general thing. You know, we take a regression class in Ghana and, you know, we can, you uh, maybe, we knew, uh, formulas never, but we, we memorize the formulas for regression, like uh, B, <laughs> intercept equals to uh, the B, you know, the, those formulas, right? And like, we we know, we know the, the thing on paper. He was actually given an Excel with two columns and asked to uh, build a simple regression model. And this is somebody who says, if taking regression back home, you know, he knows that thing, he couldn't do it and he didn't get a, a, the offer. So what I'm trying to say is, we tend, we are smart people, we get scholarship, we come, but please don't joke with the second class skills, like using the softwares. You understand the concepts, the regression, yes, intercept is the Y intercept, uh, the slope is uh, the, the rate of change, whatever, but can you actually do it? And I feel maybe right now is better, but please, know your the softwares you need to to use before you enter into the graduate program if you if you're in the statistic program you need to know r or some of the right right now python is is a, peop, a lot of people use python right so know some of the softwares and it, it, the simple ones the excel you have to know excel people excel is used everywhere i didn't really like excel but recently i understand the 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 power of excel right like i mean you can use it for the basic things and a lot of people use it so you also have to able to know your way around it so to answer the question um know the softwares you need in your program okay and you can start learning some of these things are free you can start learning about it even before you enter to the program so your lives become easy right so i guess I'll let everybody try to chime on this and I'll, I'll think about the second one. Thank you. I guess I'll speak on the, the skills part that you need to know before coming. Um, I'm going to be talking more on the soft skills part. Um, Dr. Nee mentioned the technical skills. And I would say that um, one of the important things that was helpful for me is just knowing how to ask questions and not being afraid to ask questions because um, <laughs> we're in America. Um, there's a lot of things going on around every day that you might not know. So in, instead of keeping things, keeping things to yourself, um, it's always better to ask questions and knowing how to ask the questions. And um, basically also knowing how to uh, talk to your professors, um, taking advantage of the fact that they do have office hours and they're available to talk to you. So don't be shy or um, afraid to approach them because they're here for you. They're being paid to um, be in their office to um, attend to students. So knowing how to ask questions and then knowing also how to find information for yourself, Googling and all um, for your work. And um, I would say the last thing would be being a self-motivated person, being a self-starter, because a lot of things when you're in your graduate studies and all sometimes, um, there'll not be someone there always like trying directing you at every step so knowing how to be a self-starter in certain situations would be really helpful for you yeah that's all i'll say well i want to add a brief summary to what shelly and uh mr neokan said Dr. Neokan said you see uh what especially with the excel that he said and uh, he talked about i want to add a bit of my, my own experience i think <laughs> Dr. Ni was actually referring to me <laughs> when he really shared that. Because when I came here for first no, no, please, it's not him. <laughs> <laughs> when I came for first year, we were giving some uh, risk analysis class. We were doing modeling. And there were a lot of data points. And I was scrambling, trying to get a graph paper and trying to plot <laughs> this graph. And I went to the instructor, like, instructor, I see there, there are a lot of data points. I'm not able to do this on a graph paper. You know, Mr. Emmanuel is laughing. <laughs> They're like, oh, Daniel, you don't have to do this. You can use Excel to do that. And trust me, he was the first very uh, instructor who really walked me through how to use Excel. And you know, it's coming from Ghana, of course, I never stayed here. I came here 2016. I came here straight for master's program. Some of these things we do paper-based. Uh, let's be honest with ourselves. So 
it's something that like uh, Dr. Ni said, you really, really have to learn before you come, please. Uh, learn Excel. Excel will help you a lot. It will help you in your budgeting. Most of your studies will be doing modeling. And uh, as you, when you're doing modeling, work, well, you can't be using ordinary, uh, like you said, you know the formulas, but you have to put formulas in Excel to do modeling work. And if you don't know Excel, you really get left behind. Another thing is citation management. That was to have my own experience in that. First assignment, I was called into the office and it's like, you know, this one is a very serious criminal offense, right? I'm going to pardon you on this. That's one of my conservation biology uh, teacher who said that, that like, she understood where we came from. You know, Ghana, we give you work, you go, you do some copy and paste and stuff. And it actually did not work like that. So she actually also helped me how to use Zotero, how to use Mendeley, and also use this, do this in academic writing. Most of the time we should learn how to write academically. I tell you that I came to a time my PhD advisor was like, I've been following your post on LinkedIn. I've been seeing, I know you write a lot. You're a very good writer. And you can write a very good dissertation. I love writing. I enjoy writing. And that's why part of what I do as National Interest Waiver, I write a lot for applicants. So writing is very good. No matter what, if you can write to post on LinkedIn, you can write to post in any kind of media, news outlet, start doing that. It sharpens your use of grammar, your use of phrases. And when you come to grad school, you don't start from God. Grad school is about writing. You write a whole lot of project works and you can't even count the number of project works you're going to do before you even graduate. So take note of that. And I, I, I think this will be brief, I promise. Um, for those who are yet to enter, I would say this, like you are yet to enter, right? So I think for those who are yet to enter, I would be worried more about how I get the program. Most of the things they've said are things that once you get in there, things you have to start acquainting yourself with. But um, one senior of mine, I know he won't mind if I mention his name, Siegfried, always said that, um, Emmanuel, the, the graduates committee that are going to evaluate your application and finally grant you that um, admission uh, is really kind of really important. Make communication with them, build that communication. And um, well, well, when I came to the States, I applied a lot of schools, maybe like 14. I got onto all of those schools and mostly because, well, someone can argue you had ex ex um, exceptional academic abilities. Those were through, yes. I also know people who had equally exceptional academic uh, abilities, but didn't make it. But I always found means and ways to productively communicate with a graduate chair so that the graduate chair knew my name by Emmanuel. And it got to a point when it was even Thanksgiving. I didn't, Jack, I didn't even know anything as uh, Thanksgiving. American if I'm home. I don't even know Thanksgiving. But I was not coming. But I will send them happy holidays. And I hope you enjoy the Thanksgiving break. Um, and hopefully sometime after I would hear some information about it. Right. So it got to a point even before they opened the application. He knew there was a guy called Emmanuel. And so he was going to look out for my name, right? And that's, um, you have to product it. It's not like asking so many questions that are on why It will just um, eliminate how like immature you are, right? But like ask questions, like maybe, um, maybe Lydia is the um, graduate chair. Um, uh, you are in the process of doing it. And you've seen that Lydia does something regarding Maybe uh, maybe my wife is into French, so let me use an example of French. That's something about existentialism. It's a concept in French, right? And so you go like, um, while preparing for grad school, part of it is trying to equip myself with some concepts I'll be learning. And I chanced on one of your articles that you've written, and um, but I realized that um, I do not have access to it because I don't have an account. Is it possible for you to share um, this in detail so that I will be able to read more and then grab some concept about it and if possible talk about it right these are some of the things that you are showing the person that jack i'm really interested not only in grad school but interested in learning as a whole right so these are some of the things that if you really want to get into the program are things that it will be helpful now these are for those who are yet to get in because the first thing is you have to get into the program to do all the wonderful things we are saying so some of these communication things especially with the graduates um, chair is really important for admission all right 
Thank you all for your submissions. It's really getting interesting. And I can see a lot of questions. A lot of people have raised their hand to ask their questions, but we have a lot of questions to address as well. So I would entreat our audience to hold on to their questions. If possible, you can write it down in case you would forget. And uh, we will address them later. So um, in discussing and the possible ways of navigating through the job market, I made mention of OPT and CPT. So if our um, panelists can do as the honors, since they all came in as grad students and um, they have navigated through it all. So we would like to have a brief discussion on CPT and OPT too. So anyone can start? Yeah, I think uh, if you don't mind, I want to briefly answer the, that question you asked me. You said somebody said that, what are some of the expected questions that cut across? Sure. Yeah, I just want to provide one, um, one answer to that. So there is this uh, a book, you can just Google, 60, 60 seconds and you're hired. Read that book, right? I do not, I cannot, and you know, you know, interviews, it depends on the company and stuff like that. But please take your time, Google that book. Sometimes you can get it for free. Google that book, 60 seconds and you are hired. It will guide you through some of the things you need to do uh, during an interview. I mean, if some of the panelists also have other references, uh, that's fine. Uh, I also want to hear it. Uh, before I talk about uh, OPT, and yeah, I just, I just wanted to, yeah, it's good that Doctor Ni, Ni actually address it. Uh, yeah, you, you can't actually ask all interview questions on this platform. If we do that, you know, if we finish today, uh, about thousand and one of what interviewer can actually ask you. But what you have to know, one question that I always find rhyming in all the interviews I go through is like, tell me about yourself. And of course, mm -hmm. at that point, that's not where you are going to talk about your name, your age, the food you like best. <laughs> so this question, I know that American companies like asking that question because that set the pace for the interview. That is the opportunity to talk to about your professional life, where you started your professional life from, what you are currently studying, and where you are going, and even what makes that company more attractive to you. So make sure that, like Doc said, try and find resources. There are enough on YouTube that can actually tell you how you can go about these questions. Thank you. Um. Yeah, I think um, they've said more about this, so I would um, elect not to talk about it. But um, I, I want to quickly talk about the OPT because um, I saw something on LinkedIn that uh, broke my heart. So if, if it's possible, can you give me the sharing ability um, to share something that I think it's uh, very important? I, okay, good. Now I have it. So um, first of all, I know this is recorded. C can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, so I know this is recorded, so definitely um, I, I want to say that I do not wish this for um, anybody, more or less like a Ghanaian or anything, mm -hmm. but this was a post that I saw on LinkedIn whereby students didn't know the appropriate time to apply for OPT, and long story short, um, this person was eligible, but because of lack of information, this person has to depart the United States, right? So the last thing I want for anybody, any international students, especially Ghanaians, is that at least you should know much about OPT in a way that you can use it to your advantage, right? So I'll start by saying that OPT is, um, the full meaning I think is um, optional practical training, right? Um, the meaning doesn't really matter, but what it means is that it is an authorization that gives you an opportunity to temporarily work in the US. And um, as an international student who um, is about to graduate, now, now I, um, I, I want you to pay particular attention, who is about to graduate, you are entitled to OPT, right? And um, regardless of what type of program you study, so this is true for associate's degree, this is true for bachelor's degree, this is true for master's degree, this is true for PhD degree, you are entitled to the, or the first OPT, which is the initial OPT, which is one year. However, there is also an additional year, but that depends on the nature of the program you study whether or not this program has been designated as a STEM program, right? And the timing of the application is really important. 
Because here in the United States, um, if it's um, 60 days after you graduate your master's degree or PhD degree, if you haven't um, had some form of next status, you should depart from the US. So you want to make sure that before even that 60 days, and, and one thing I always say is that USCIS, it takes a lot. I have applied for EB1, I successfully applied for EB1 and EB2. Everything with USCIS is time taking, time rack nerving and all of those things. So you need to be very proactive. So if you're a student, you are so sure that you want to use OPT. I, I want to say this, which is important. You don't need a job offer for your first OPT. So I don't want to hear because, oh, I haven't gotten a job offer, so I can't apply for OPT. No, you don't need a job offer for your first OPT. The only thing you need is that you have to um, get to your international office where they will um, issue you a new I-20 that will state the start date and the end date of your first OPT. For that, you don't need any job. You just need that I-20. You, uh, you pay for the, as we speak today, I think it's $410. Um, you pay for that application, it is done online, and then you submit it. Again, you don't need a job offer before you apply for that one. And the timing is really important. You need to apply for it. Usually, I advise people two or three months before your end of program puts in the application. Um, but latest by at least a month to your graduation, you should have done that application because it is really important. Now, if you're in a STEM program, um, definition of STEM is now very huge. Then you can Google and find that out, right? That is another scale of graduate school. Google what is STEM program according to USCIS, uh, US Department of uh, uh, Homeland. They have a lot of definition. Nowadays, finance and all those programs and MBAs have all been classified as um, STEM program. If you have that, then it means that you have an additional two years. But for that, addition, for that additional two years, you need a job offer. And then your job should also be an e-verify employer, right? So these are the two criteria. Like you have to, for your second OPT, which is two-year OPT, you need a job offer. So you should have a solid job offer in hand. And then you should also uh, make sure that your employer is e-verified. This is really important to me because if you're about to graduate and you are sure you are going for the job route, apply for your first OPT, even though you know you don't have a job yet. Now there is a caveat. For the first year that you don't need a job offer, you are given at least, I think, 60 days to get a job, else you have to depart out of the country. However, the first year OPT, even volunteering counts as job offer. Right, so you could stick around with your supervisor, your advisor, whereby you keep doing some things. You could even be doing research with your advice. For the purposes of immigration, it will be considered as you've been doing things that satisfies your um, one year OPT. So even while you aggressively search for job, you could be volunteering so that you can show USCIS that in my first year, I did um, what I was supposed to do. So it, I'm not saying deliberately not get a job offer. Try always to get a job offer, but you shouldn't say because I don't have it yet, I can't apply and I have to leave the country for the first year. You can always use volunteering to work around it. I, I believe people will share their experience, but I thought you should at least know there is something called OPT and you're entitled to it for the first time, even when you don't have a, a job offer. Awesome. Anyone else to add up? I'd like to add to um, Dr. Nee's talk on the, no, sorry, actually Emmanuel's <laughs> talk on the, uh, the STEM part of OPT. Um, I just wanted to add that when you're on the, the STEM extension part of your OPT, please be proactive to know the deadlines because um, there are certain requirements when you're on the STEM OPT that Homeland Security requires from you, like verification of your address and um, filling out the student evaluation form. It's called the I-983 and they give you certain deadlines. It's like a six month check-in throughout the two years. So make sure that you don't miss those deadlines because um, they always say that if you happen to miss them, it can cause termination of your service record because they haven't heard from you and your information hasn't been verified. So make sure that you're really proactive on that, work in hand with your international um, student office, making sure that they update your files on time all the time when you're on STEM OBT, yeah.
And a short, a short, a short advice I want to add is that, uh, sorry, uh, uh, so with we're talking about internship, and you really have to be careful. You can do some internship in the summer time, but when you extend, go beyond your summer, and you want to, you want to say extra time for internship, going like like six months to nine months, then the university will begin giving you something called CPT, curriculum practical training. It's just like the OPT, just that this one is before you graduate. Now, CPT is allowed on a standard of, is it like nine months or so? Yeah, when you exceed that, any amount of time you add outside your CPT, allowable CPT, it's into your OPT. So let's say you are a STEM field and you are doing CPT nine months pre-graduation, and you say that, oh, the company would like me a lot. They want me to stick around for more time. I want to add six months to it. That six months you are adding to that nine months is taken out of your OPT. So instead of maybe getting an additional two years extension of the OPT, you're maybe going to get one and a half year of extension. So it's something you want to take note of that the more you are doing CPT, the more you are eating up your OPT time. So take note of that. Yeah, thanks, um, Dan, for bringing this up. And I, I had a friend, a Nigerian friend, who was really particular about um, how um, the CPT would not affect the OPT. Um, um, Lydia, permit me, there is somebody quickly asking, um, if a master's student and you want to get into a PhD program, do you need an OPT? I think it lends itself nicely into our conversation. Um, if you are within um, a program of study, then you don't need an OPT. You need the CPT, as Dan was saying. And CPT is the curriculum and um, practical training. It allows you to work. And now th this is, as far as um, I'm aware of, it allows you to work full time during um, school vacations. So you can work 40 hours um, when school is not in section. However, you can continue to work CPT during school days. However, it has to be part time. It shouldn't exceed 40 hours. Now, let me explain a little bit about the CPT. Before you can um, engage in the CPT, the good thing about CPT is that everything is done at your university level, the international student level. It doesn't go to USCIS. Unlike OPT, where you have to submit everything to USCIS. So everything will be with your Office of International Students. Now, you need to, first of all, register some credits in school. So you have to register a minimum of two credits for the CPT because the CPT is taken as a class. However, this class is that you are going out for some experience. So first of all, you need your advisor to sign off. You need your advisor saying that this um, internship experience that whoever is going for is directly related to the program of study. And it's really important for this person's program of study. And so you need that um, advisor um, like uh, assurance and you need the job offer, like the, the, the internship job offer. Then you contact with those information, you need to register for a two credits, which you pay for. And then you, with those information, you reach out to your office of international students, whereby they would issue you another I-20 stating the start date and then your end date for your CPT. So, but another way to kind of circumvent um, this idea of your CPT won't count towards your OPT is that if if it is um, if you intend to do more of uh, uh, the CPT, then do more of the part time because once you start doing the full time, then um, as Dan said, at a point it starts eating into your OPT, so you will not be entitled to the one year that we just spoke about. It could be eight months for you or seven months for you, but if you but the on the unlimited part time does not affect your OPT in any way. And that is usually, I know some, some people which we call the one CPT, where you don't have to know what that is, but they use that to work um, while they school in general. But um, yes, this, the CPT is um, done while you are in school. And then the OPT is usually done when you are about completing or when you are done with uh, school. Uh, you, in line of OPT, what do you need OPT for? Um, you need OPT, it's a work authorization, right? So that includes if, for example, when I was, I'm currently working as a postdoc and I used my OPT um, to apply for this postdoc position. Um, however, I want to say clearly that with the university system, 
they could have easily done what we call the H1B for you because it, it's no pain to them. It's not a lottery to them. Um, it's a relatively um, straightforward thing. But um, OPT, to cut it short, OPT is something that is usually done by USCIS after school and then CPT is done by your international office um, during your school. But you have to pay attention to the timeline so that it doesn't eat into the time for your OPT. Please, I want to just for a quick add up to what uh, Dr. Manuel Barton said uh, concerning the guy who said, if you are currently a master's student and have a desire of continuing with the PAD right after, uh, after, should we still get an OPT before two to three months before your end of your program? That is a particular case which ha happened to me. I remember that when I finished my master's, I was still between doing a PAD or uh, going on OPT, uh, that means going out uh, to work. And when I was struggling to get an environmental science uh, job, OPT, whatever it is, uh, I then changed my mind I want to do PAD. By that time, I had already applied for OPT and it was with USCIS. So the only thing you do is that I wrote a letter to just cancel the application or withdraw the application. I lost my $410, but the best thing that they canceled it. Now, if you are about to apply and you are very sure that you have gotten a PAD offer, a very solid offer, don't go and waste your four hundred and ten dollars applying for the two or three months before graduation because you are not going to use it anyway. Uh, but if you are not sure of the offer, maybe you know researchers change their mind all the time. I thought they can even lose the funding, and the PAD admission can be in jeopardy. So if you want to be on the safe side, therefore if you are not sure of that admission, then we will say that apply for the OPT as maybe a backup plan. Uh, so that's what I wanted to ask. Yeah, and actually, that's what, what uh, happened to me as well. Uh, after the master's, uh, then uh, even though I wanted to do the PhD, you know, uh, working working comes with a little bit more money. So <laughs> I was still, I mean, I know I know I, I want to do PhD, but my mind is telling me go and go and get some job. So I actually got the OPT, um, uh, but you know, funny thing is. I enter into the PhD program before they came to give me a job of final to them because I'm in the PhD program. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'll not accept the job offer, right? So that's that's what happened. Uh, so you can just get the OPT as a backup plan. Yeah. Okay. So a lot has been said. Um, knowing our pathway right after school getting a job or internship right after school to count. So um, after all that, we would want to know, like um, transitioning, getting your job or knowing what to do next after your school. We want to know how we can transition from being an international student to a citizen, maybe through H1B, NIW, marriage, EB1, EB2. So the first has to do with um, what does it mean to be an F1, F2, J1, J2 status? Okay, as an immigration uh, paralegal, I think this should be quite straightforward. F1 is just a visa status you'll be on as you are coming to the United States to study full time. Uh, mm -hmm. F2 is a dependent or a spouse of F1. So uh, if you have a husband or a wife you want to bring to the United States as you study, in fact, the United States have given that privilege that you can bring your spouse here. And when I was studying, I remember I brought my spouse here on F2. So that is it. Now, J1 uh, is more of like exchange uh, program vi uh, visa, which other people also use for academic purpose. But one thing with J1 is that it has to come with some conditionalities. Uh, for instance, whether you have to return to your home country or not. Some countries have straight requirements that right after your program, willy-nilly, you have to depart the United States to your country and spend about two years there before you can even come back to the US. Others also grant waivers, especially for those who are seeking to apply for green card after school. Uh, USCIS may look at your country restrictions and either deny or grant you this waiver. So that is the J1. And of course, J2 is also like a dependent on J1. Uh, of course, that's how it means. So I think that's the short explanation I can give to that. Okay. And the next is, so what then are the opportunities of um, F1, F2, or J1, J2? 
what are some of the opportunities that they have, those on such um, status? Lydia, before we continue, um, someone sent me a message saying that can his questions be answered before this session on the F1, F2, but I'm not sure what questions he had though. Um, yeah, I, I actually had a wanted us to finish with this section so that um, like the rest of the time will be used for just questioning and answering. Okay. Yeah. That's fine. Thank you. Sure. So, so opportunities mm -hmm. for F1. I remember when I got my admission, I came here. Uh, my roommate that I came to meet, uh, he's a Ghanaian student, but uh, hard, of, hard of hearing, like uh, deaf students. So he told me sign language, American sign language, and he asked me, what kind of visa are you on? I said, F1. I said, oh, good. F1 is good. F1 is good. I said, what about J1? I said, no, J1, don't go for J1. <laughs> like, so F1 gives you more of kind of advantages than uh, J1 because F1, uh, when you are transitioning from visa status to permanent residence, it's very straightforward and easy. J1, like I said, comes with a whole lot of its restrictions. So that's one thing I know with uh, F status. Uh, and plus, of course, whatever uh, privileges you have as a student in the United States, your ability to work is there, of course, which is 20 hours on school time session and 40 hours during summer times. So that one is there. And the only thing you don't have to do is actually mess up with your social security number or work outside campus, because at times some people tend to overdo this. With F1, if you are facing hardship, uh, you can actually apply for uh, uh, a relief that uh, maybe the USCIS will grant you permit to work outside campus uh, under circumstances of hardship. So it's also something which is there, which some people explore. I don't know the kind of uh, how the explanation you have to give, but some people give a whole lot of explanation and try to work out of campus for that. So uh, it's one of the, a lot of privileges you have as an international student, but the US can be very, very messy with you when you actually go overboard and do certain things. Let me share an experience. Uh, I was in this immigration forum and there was this uh, Indian student who was like, okay, there was this thing which came around, is it called Amway or something? Yeah, so uh, I've always like, it's a multi-level marketing and this student thought that, oh, it's something that I can get cool cash as a student, you know? Of course, the internet doesn't belong to America. This is something I can do online. So he was doing this thing and it came to a time after his green card, he has to go for interview. And the officer was like, did you work outside your campus? And that was a question which hit him so hard that he didn't know how to respond. He said, oh, sort of, he said, no. The officer was like, we know everything, so you better be honest. So like, okay. I did this Amway program. I earned a lot of money. I filed taxes. And I think that's right. And long story short, his green card was denied. That is it. There was nothing that could be done about it. So be careful at times, even the online marketing stuff that people will bring to you as an F1 student. Or you can get cool cash here, cool cash there. If the work is not related to your university campus, forget it. It's, uh, it's not uh, an authorized work. Uh, unless you're on CPT or something that maybe you are working off campus. Yeah. Okay, and so having said all of this, um, I know that being on F1 status gives you a lot of leverage, but then I know that there are some limitations to it. So can you briefly highlight some of the limitations being on F1, F2, J1, J2 status? Yeah, so uh, like I said with F1, of course, the number of hours you are allowed to work uh, is restricted when school is in full session. And in summertime, you can actually work 40 hours per week. So uh, that's one of the restrictions I've known. Another thing you have to know on F1 is how you travel. Yes, uh, if you, you know that if you travel out of the United States and spend more than five months, you will need a new visa to enter the United States. You need a new service uh, record and I-20 to do that. So for those who think they can, okay, go out of the US and spend some time and get a break on their, or they are studies and go and spend some time. When you go out and you spend more than five months, you need a new visa, a new I-20 to come in. Uh, another thing is that people always have this kind of belief that, okay, let me come to the United States, I can defer my program and work and make some money and later go back to the <laughs> campus. And the moment you defer, you have 10 days to leave the United States. So the United <laughs> States is like, uh, they are not giving you any briefing space. That is why I always mostly I advise people that when you come on F1 and you think you will have the, uh, the, the, the desire to stay permanently in the United States, start working towards it and start, because uh, once you are on F1, so then you are under the microscope of the you know, USCIS, they will monitor you everywhere. 
But once you get your green card, USCIS don't care what you do with your life. Uncle Sam don't care whatever you do with that. Or maybe unless I've done, I've just avoid crime, unless you uh, don't just get yourself into any crime scenario. But once you get your green card, you have some liberty to yourself, travel out so far as you don't spend more than six months outside. That one crime has its own restriction. So you see, uh, that is one of the things I also don't want to talk about. Now with J1, like I said, transitioning from J1 to green card have its own, whether a waiver or a restriction. Uh, some countries want you to return to your home country. Others too will give you a waiver. So that is like a bit of what I know with the J1. And some people also transition from J1 to O status. So J1 is used at times for some researchers. For instance, there are some exchange researchers who come to the United States to do research. And at times they come through J1, which is more like when the research is in a kind of a bit of short time. But after that, they also can also uh, adjust status from J1 to uh, O visa. O visa is something like the EB2 national interest waiver, but that one is a bit more temporal and it doesn't actually grant you permanent residence. So there's a kind of uh, little, little kind of uh, privileges here and there, but it's, each of these also come with its own kind of restrictions. And every student, you have to do your own research. The internet is a whole lot of resource for us. Uh, the internet will give you a whole lot of information on this, on what you can do and what you cannot do on this basis. To add a little to what Dan said, is um, some of the restrictions of being F1 is that whenever you travel of, um, out of the country, you need um, your ISO, when I say ISO, International Student Office designated to sign. They have to sign before you can get out of the country. And that signature is usually valid for travels within a year. And after you have to go back, right? So it means that whenever you are traveling out of the country, you need that um, thing. Else, when you are coming in, it's going to be a, a whole lot. Um, Dan also said something about the restrictions on J1. And that's true, especially if you're adjusting your status to the green card. Um, you need to have either a waiver or um, you need to go back to the country, save that two years before you can apply for the adjustment of status. Now, regarding F2, um, you, you, your spouse or your dependents, whoever it is, cannot be able to work whatsoever, right? There, there is no working opportunity there. There is even no social security that will be granted to anybody on F2. The best you can get is your 10 number, but you never get uh, social security. Um, however, you can school. On F2, you can school, but it should be part-time and uh, all of those things. So let's say if you have kids and um, and your kids um, are like in the K-12 system, they can go to school and all of those things and all of it but yeah there, there are a lot of restrictions and the, the easiest restriction is um, you can't work off campus without authorization like anytime you need to work off, off campus you need cpt right and that is true for f1 j1 f2 whatever f2 you can't even work so you're out of it but f1 and j1 there are some leeways but even with that you need authorizations before you can transition um so those are some of the limitations that the uh, um, is for the F1, F2 uh, as well. Okay. So we haven't said all of this. Um, how can we navigate from F1, J1 to H1B, then from there to being a citizen? Well, I would say that first off, you don't need to go from F1 to H1. It's not required. If you want to, that's fine. But okay. you, there is no transition as you have to go from F1 to H1, then from H1 to green card. No, you can go directly from F1 to green card. You can go directly from F2 to green card. You, there is no like leeway. Now, the reason why it may seem like um, you have to go through F1 to H1 is that um, usually this tends to happen if you are going through the industry routes um, or sometimes even in the academia as well um, you know f1 is short-lived right it's not it's not um so long it's just three years if you're in stem program so what that means is that while you're getting close to your three years if you still want to stay in the u.s and you don't have your green card yet then you need to apply for an h1 so that's when the h1 comes in and for for those of you wondering h1 is also a non-immigrant um, visa status that allows you to work um, it's a maximum of six years. Uh, it's it's given in three years, in a chunk of three years. So the first one is given for three years, and then the second one is given for an additional three years. Um, um, another thing, and however, 
we would have conversations about it. But some things that are really important regarding the um, H1 is that um, the H1, depending on where you are working, it's going to be a lottery system, right? So like um, someone like myself or Dr. Okai, we are in the academia and so the lottery system doesn't work um, for us. Like if you are if you are in the academia or you are in a non-government organizations or you are teaching at the high school and all those things, H-1B, uh, so let me explain how you get H-1B so that it makes a little sense to you. So H-1B is done by the employer. Like you can't do it by yourself. Like there should be an employer who is willing to file for H-1B for you. Now, um, the employer can file for H-1B for you in certain times if you are in an industry world, right? So for example, if you're in the industry world, the application tends to open somewhere around March, um, early in March, and then it closes this year, it's, uh, due to technical issues, it's closed around 20th of March. So for an in, um, what that means is that during that time, this company will file for you as an H1. And now the, if, it's, if it's a company that is filing for you, it is not guaranteed that you are going to get the H1B. You go through a lottery process. So there'll, there'll be so many people who apply. Think of so many people, like uh, I'm sure a year they can receive 300,000, 400,000 applicants, a lot of them. However, they, they have numbers. Um, the, the initial one is 20,000 and then they give um, extra 60,000 for the masters, right? So your company would have to go through this process. And then if you are picked, now there's the clause, if you are picked, then hooray, you have six years more to, to work in the United States. But I want to say this clearly, that if you are also in the academia aspect or non-government or, uh, sorry, government or non-profit organizations, there are no time restrictions on when your company can apply. So your, your company can apply any time of the year, like January, February, March, April, and you are guaranteed you are going to get the H-1B, right? So the H-1B allows you that temporary status of like six years, which also definitely will come to an end sometime after your sixth, sixth year, right? So it's also kind of like a transition period where if you haven't had your green card, you could either get as um, a route to um, your permanent residency. But in general, I would say that it's not required for you to wait, even um, for you to rely on H1B. I, sometimes I always say this, that I wish I had enough information. I would have applied for EB1 and EB2 way before I completed school. Um, so you don't have to wait and, for all this route. You can take matters into your hand, uh, apply for it, um, but you have to do a lot of work. You have to read carefully about the criteria and the requirements for um, each of these pathways of getting the green card. We have what we call the EB1, which is um, called an alien of extraordinary ability. And that is the highest preference. Um, it's usually for that preference, you need to show three um, requirements out of 10, right? Um, when I applied it, um, I, I think I showed four requirements instead of three. You can show at least three, right? So we have the EB1, but the EB1, I would say that um, it has higher bar. What that means is that um, the, the judgment for EB1 is usually a little bit harder than the EB2. Now, that is not to lowball the EB2. EB2 is equally as hard as it gets, but um, the EB1 is a little bit tougher. Like the expectation for EB1 is high. Now the EB2 and IW, which I also did both of them. Now it's insane. I did both of them because I had I had trust issues with USCIS. But uh, anyway, you are not required to do both of them. You can just do one, and then you are fine, right? So the EB2 also has its own and a lot of ways you have to show that. Um, I think Dan will speak more about that as well. But basically, it is. Um, showing four big things that you have an advanced graduate degree um, usually that is being awarded by the U.S. and if it's not awarded by the U.S. then you have to um, evaluate let's say you have your master's degree from Ghana that works but you have to evaluate it so that it is shown that this degree is equivalent to that of the United States uh, and that that is the first thing you have to show. The next thing that you have to show is that your um, proposed endeavor is um, of national importance and substantial merit to the United States. What that typically means is that, um, let's say that um, 
Dr. Neil kind of said that he's into a uh, modeling of maybe financial stance, right? So Dr. Neil Kind's uh, proposed endeavor will be a researcher in modeling of financial stuff. That is his proposed research endeavor, right? So now Dr. Neil Kind has to prove to USCI is that what he's doing as a researcher of modeling in financial stocks has national importance and substantial merits to the United States, right? So this is where he goes to bring in argument about um, if, if US doesn't do what he's saying, US is going to suffer. And he's not just going to be saying things like that. He needs evidence, right? He's going to pull out articles. He's going to pull out media support. And sometimes you may even have to go all the extent and go into Congress and, and what have Congress said about what they have been doing as a researcher. Um, is this research funded by a lot of federal agencies, right? Because those are all evidence showing that whatever Dr. Neokai is doing is of national importance, else the US will not be funding money for things that they don't deem important to their country, right? Maybe whatever um, Dr. Neokai is doing is going to come up with a model that is going to help um, em employability in the US. He's going to see all of those things to share how his endeavor is of national importance. So at that point, it, it, the, the, the thing about showing the national importance is that it has nothing to do with Dr. Neokai as a person. It is about his proposed endeavor, the, the researcher of a financial modeling. How is that as a proposed endeavor important to the, to the, um, to the US? And I, I want to hammer this. Like you need to really hit on its importance to the US. So for example, let's say you're in a medical field, right? And then you do things relating to cancer, right? You can go back into the field and say that, see, if we pick four Americans, three of them are likely to die out of cancer. However, as a researcher, I have done these things that can mitigate these issues. That is why I'm telling you that my proposed endeavor is of importance, not to me, but to the US, because a lot of people are suffering from it. Maybe you're an electrical field, right? Maybe you do things regarding than semiconductors, fine, right? You can go back explaining that, well, as somebody who I'm doing semiconductors, I'm, I've come up with so many efficient ways of explaining certain, um, um, even producing certain semiconductors, which will ease um, production of cars and production of computers. And as we all know, that is a big thing and it's really important. You can also argue that, well, if we don't do do the things that I'm doing, US lose its competitiveness. You can cite China, you can cite UK, are prosperous in doing these things. And so if US stands to gain, then it means you have to alarm it. So this is all this thing I'm saying is just one aspect. Now you, you are done with that aspect. Hooray, if you're able to convince the consular, that's uh, the adjudicating officer, that's fine. Now the next thing is really about you as a person. Daniel said that he's into waste management control, right? So the next person is, now Daniel as a human being, can you prove to us that you can you are well positioned to advance your um, waste management um, sector, right? Now that is really about you as a human being. What are some of the things? He said something interesting that he's a get fund uh, recipient, right? He can explain how difficult it is to be, accepted into to get fund. And therefore, by that propendus, it means that he's of high quality standard, right? He mentioned that he has a master's degree, for example. That's, he even said it's a double master's degree. That in itself is, is competitive. He mentioned that, for example, he has a PhD program. You can describe how tough it is to even be admitted into his PhD program and leverage on how it's really important. Maybe he has published some papers. He can also talk about how these publications may or may not have received citation. Now, I want to state this clearly um, on record. Citation is not the only requirement that USCI is watch. I don't have citation. I'm not proud of it. I'm working towards it. But it shouldn't be that because you don't have citations, you are um, limited for this program. Like, there are opportunities for you to get it. Don't um, close your um, uh, your doors just because you don't have citations. And I want to say this again, that certain programs get citations quicker than the other. That is naturally known. And sometimes because of confidential reasons and all that problems, citation is really difficult to come by, right? So the, the next part is really showing how you as a person, you can really advance that proposed endeavor. It's about you. Maybe you've reviewed articles for, um, for um, journals, right? So you bring that out. I've, I've served as a reviewer. 
right? For example, I, ha I have served as a reviewer for a couple of journals. So you bring that up, like I've served as a reviewer. You receive some scholarships that are competitive. You bring all those things up. At that point, it's really about, I wouldn't say bragging, but packaging your experiences to highlight your exceptional abilities, right? And then the last part, which is kind of... Um, on 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 the whole, it makes sense for us to waive your labor pen certification. It's kind of like summarizing all the things you said. That hey, see, I'm doing things that are really important to the US. That if I don't continue, US suffers, right? And then I'm really positioned to advance certain things that I've said that I'm going to do. I keep doing it, and I can do it. And see, even if you if even if you grant me this green card, I'm not displacing some US workers. Like I'm not going to. It's not going to affect the employability of U.S. workers because pr probably your field as a whole, people are already lacking. So it's not like there are a lot of people and then once you get there, you're going to make the place saturated. Like it is not saturated. So U.S. suffers. So a um, couple of those reasons, it's really important to um, grant to you the NIW. So that, that's kind of like a 10, uh, maybe a five minute presentation on how it, but of course you have to write a whole petition explaining all these things and then you attach them with evidence. You don't say anything to the USI, USCIs and go scores free, no. Everything should be attached with evidence. If you know you don't have evidence, don't mention it. So you mention anything, you provide evidence as an exhibit, which sometimes depends on how you arrange them in, in general. And so you can think of that um, as a way that you can apply for it. Now, you may think this is overwhelming because it's just a short um, description, but it isn't too huge. I, I think that if you are in graduate school, then you are capable of doing almost everything, uh, except not dying. But in, in general, like uh, these are some of the ways that, and of course, I, I forget the other one. You can genuinely fall in love with a U.S. citizen. I mean, if you find love and then this person happens to be a U.S. citizen, that is another conversation, right? But some of us were already in tune with Ghanaian. So those are some of the ways you can think about uh, gaining U.S. Um, permanent residence. Wow. <clears throat> I know uh, I know uh, uh, Imano spoke, spoke a lot. Um, but for me, I mean, I know that it's a lot of information that Dr. Andrew said, uh, but for me, what I did was to allow my, uh, you know, through uh, through the F ones, right, and the OPTs, and I did that. I did an OPT in the master's program. I allowed my international students help me do that. All I need, I did was to pay, right. I did OPT in my PhD. The international student office helped me to do that. When I, um, uh, with H1B, the international office in the university helped me do that, right? Uh, when uh, the green card, when they started the application, they told me, okay, we are going to do this. And I just had to provide them what they needed, right? So I don't want you to be overwhelmed with, uh, I know, uh, uh, doctor gave us a lot of information, right? There are places that are meant to help you do that. If you are smart like Dr. Audro, you, you can do the application yourself. But some of us, you know, we, we just allow some people to help us. So uh, for me specifically, uh, I think, let me pull out some. So when uh, our university uh, would do the process, um, <laughs> Uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Andrew said he's not smart. <laughs> uh, our university will do the process up to, uh, so we have what we, I mean, there are a lot of processes, right? But the investor will do the process up to the I-140 for you, right? Then after the I-140, I know, I know like a lot of form names, you can read about it. After the I-140, they will want you to do your own application. The, the, the last step after, after the I-140 is, um, is I-485. That is adjustment of status. For that one, they want you to do it. So that's where I got a lawyer. I got a lawyer who uh, then did that for me, right? So what I'm trying to say is there are people that can help you do all that, right? And uh, for me, I've gotten institutions in the universities 
that helped me to do that. The only thing I had to bring in a lawyer is the last stage of the green card process, which is the uh, changing your status, right? And I think uh, I had to pay around 10,000 for myself and the family, the whole, pro the lawyer fees, uh, the health, health, you do some health, um, you go to go and do some health stuff, you pay for that. So I think adding everything up, I pay like 10,000, right? For myself and my wife, right? Uh, my two kids were born here, so they didn't need to do that, right? So, I mean, don't be overwhelmed with the information. There are places to help you go through this stuff. I like to add <laughs> on to Dr. Nese. So, um, if you don't have the pleasure of being in the educate academia where they can do your H1B and stuff, and you're like me, where um, I was in the industry, um, and you have to depend on H1B, I like to say that don't put all your eggs into H1B because when you're in the industry, it is not guaranteed. It's a lottery system. And I was part of that experience where your company wants to sponsor you and they put you in the H1B and then you were not selected in the lottery. That happened to me exactly a year ago, March. Yeah, basically. And um, right after that, that's when I basically went on to start applying for the EB2 NIW. And um, in about six months from when I applied to, yeah, everything, I'm now a permanent resident in six months. Um, so I would say that, um, just like Dr. Nee said, don't get overwhelmed. It's a lot of information, but then, like I said in the beginning, know how to look for information, know how to ask questions when you need them. And for, for my experience in the EB2 NIW, Daniel was one of the uh, great help on my experience. He was really helpful in helping me navigate, especially the petition letter. So that basically, um, I would say, added to my success in the EB2. So, yeah. I would say if you're interested in wanting to stay in the United States and you're not in the industry, you're not in the academia field where H-1B is not guaranteed and you have to go through the industry where um, H-1B is not guaranteed, um, just start working on EB2. If you know that you qualify from the beginning, start putting together your files even while you're in school, just so you know that you have enough time to be able to get it in on time because um, the wait process for EB2 is also not guaranteed. Well, currently Homeland Security has premium processing for everyone now where you have to pay 2,500 for um, your application to be processed in 45 days. But if you don't have that money and you have to wait for regular processing like I did, but thankfully mine was processed in three months, miraculously. Yeah, so um, start ahead of time. And uh, if you get H1B along the way, that's good because it can still buy you time while you wait for all your things to be processed. But if you don't have it, that, um, yeah, that luxury for H1B, like I didn't have, just start working on EB2 ahead of time. So that's what I'll say. Uh, so Shirley, I know I'm a panelist here, but I'm interested in your situation. <laughs> uh, six months was very fast, so, so we thank God for that. Uh, but I just want to ask a quick question. Uh, so with, the, with your application, did you have to like uh, start... Uh, so where, where does it start? It start does it start with the I-40 or how, how is it? If you can throw more light on that. Yeah, um, for my application, so I also didn't use a lawyer. It was a self-petition. I didn't want to spend oh, that. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to give lawyers 10000 yeah, Can you please tell Dr. Okain that we are not in the business <laughs> world, so we don't get paid <laughs> six figures and we are paid five figures and so yeah. we can't pay 10000 Exactly. Yeah, I wasn't ready to give lawyers $10,000. And actually the lawyers, um, they usually do a free evaluation of resumes if you just want to see if you, if you are eligible for NIW. And I've done that in 2021, but they told me I don't qualify. So um, I left them alone. And in 2022, that's when I started the process. And when I decided to apply, that's when I also found uh, Daniel's YouTube page and I got in contact with them. So for me, um, like I said, I started right after um, I didn't get selected in the H-1B, which was March. And um, when I asked my company also that, oh, can they just do the green card for me? Because you don't need to be on H-1B before green card. They told me that, oh, you need to have had three years of work experience before joining the company. So that's another thing to look out for if you want to, um, if you want to depend on a company to sponsor your green card. Make sure you have all these things that they usually want. So um, yeah, since they said no, I started working on the EB2 NIW. And also another thing I did, which some people might say is risky, 
was doing a concurrent application, which people don't usually do. <laughs> and when I say concurrent, is it means that um, you apply for the NIW at the same time with your green card. You're putting your green card application also at the same time. And you only do that if you're like really sure that you're going to get an approval because if your NIW is denied, it goes on your record that, oh, you were, let's say on F1 like me, and then you wanted to integrate. Yeah. So it goes on your record. And if you happen to go outside the United States and you want to come back and you need to go for a visa interview again, um, it's on your record. So they might deny you a visa to return because you try to integrate while you want F1, which is a non-immigrant visa. So um, I started the process. March, April, May, um, in about two months, I got my application together and um, I submitted on July 22nd. And then after three months, October 27th, I got the approval. And then um, two months after that, January 4th, I got the green card approval also, so. Well, okay. well congrats. <laughs> and I I'm glad I joined the meeting today because now <laughs> anybody that asks me, I can say, I know somebody who, who got everything <laughs> Did it herself in six months? So, uh, Daniel, everybody, thanks, thanks for for this. Yeah. Oh yeah. So, uh, I know Shani came to me. I was like, oh, I don't have citations. I don't have publication. Are you sure we can get approved? Is it? Yeah. So, for those who are interested in NIW, I think uh, Doctor Emmanuel uh, Barton have said everything. Uh, he really gave a very good detailed presentation. It's a whole lot of documentation you have to gather. And mm -hmm. it's doable. Even if your CV is, is not that stellar right now, uh, I can tell you that that's why I would say start earlier. Uh, as you're a student, attend conferences, give poster presentations. There are a lot of things that you can do to put together, even evidences as email. Send abstract to conferences. Let the uh, organizers return your abstract. That, okay, your abstract is good. We want you to present. You may not necessarily have to go, but that email alone also shows that you are recognized as an expert in your field. People don't know these things. So, it's something that is a whole kind of documents gathering and um, hosting an NIW sem a webinar with the Church of Pentecost at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, so after this, uh, uh, let's say the next 15 minutes, I may have to uh, beg leave of the host and leave. Uh, but those who are interested, if you go to my LinkedIn page, I think the, uh, the poster is there with the ID, Zoom ID, everything. It, I think there's a capacity as to what the Zoom can take and a lot of people are interested. So uh, tr please try and join early. So that is it, and it's about evidence gathering. One thing I want to say is about lawyers and citations and publications. I know somebody posting that if you have publications from Ghana, can you still use it? Of course, publication from anywhere in the world that you have actually done before, you can use it. But I always tell people that don't get so much fixated on publication and citations. There are a lot of other things you can use to meet criteria. EB2 National Interest Waiver is a more of a lower level than, like Doc said, than the EB1. EB2 is like a giveaway green card, and it's something that you can easily do. And mostly when applicants come and I walk them through their CV and why they qualify, they, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are kind of, their morale really goes up. Initially, they, they kind of uh, see themselves as, oh, I don't qualify, I can't get this. But after the meeting, they really get high morale because USCIS have never even mentioned anywhere that they demand publication and citation to actually get you approved. I don't know where that one was coming from. I think they're getting that idea from EB1 because EB1 at times you have to get some number of citations to actually get that target. But even that does say he was still able to get approved without that much citation. So don't let citation discourage you. I started my own uh, NIW when three lawyers turned me down and I gathered courage, I gathered all documents, filed everything on my own and I got approved without a single request for evidence. No RFE, I got approved. And I know that that is why I went into immigration and started studying about immigration and paralegal stuff because a lot of students are going through this. A lot of people have turned down, they have returned home, they shouldn't have gone home because they could have done it on their own. People come to me with a lot of resume and I'm like, you see, I didn't even have a quarter of what you had, but I got approved. So put yourself together, you can do this thing. And they get that confidence and then they get approved. So because I know besides Shelly, there are other people that I don't want to mention names, they also gotten approved through my help. When you come to me, I don't tell you I'll file everything for you. I'm giving you coaching, I'm giving you structure, and I'm giving you supervision. That is what I can, I can do for you. You should be prepared to work on it because uh, it is your green card. You can explain your research better to the USCIS than what a lawyer can do. Let me now come to lawyer. I don't mean to kind of, uh, kind of uh, snowball lawyers here, but not every lawyer is a specialist. Trust me. I have clients who came to me. One Nigerian was like, two lawyers have disappointed her, and now she's maxing out on OPT 
and now even EB2 is retrogressing. So that means worst case scenario, she still have to return to Nigeria and come back after her NIW is approved to actually go through consular processing. She may not be able to do adjustment of status. Meanwhile, she could have done this earlier if she has gotten the right help. And when she brings those old petition to me, I ask her, the lawyer really found this thing for you? She said, yes. And that means that I don't put too much trust in lawyers because you can explain your research better. If you can do it better, do that. If you can write a graduate thesis, of course you can do this thing. The whole petition is mostly averagely about uh, 50 pages, averagely. This is this is me. This is me giving them a thumbs up. Like like I'm not saying lawyers are bad or anything, but trust me. Like all the lawyers told me, Charlie, I'm not cut for the thing. How can you tell me I'm not cut for the thing? Were you there with me when I was in my school? So please, um, like if you can write a thesis, you can write that thing. It's not. It's, it, I I like that statement. Thank you me. can do it and go to our YouTube page. I have a lot of training going on. And I thought people file on their own. I have people who message me that, Danny, I follow your YouTube and I got approved. I even didn't have to get involved. That shows you the kind of impact you are having on people's lives. And after filing, if you are not confident, I want me to go through your petition. I can equally go do that. Uh, people who come to me with already filed one, I do some touches here and there for them and the whole thing becomes back, gets back to standard. So uh, I won't go back to much into EB2 National Interest Waiver right now. Because there's going to be a webinar on it. Uh, I'll try to post it on the chat, the, uh, the kind of the flyer. Uh, but please, please start gathering evidence. Start doing some. Yeah, thank you very much. Somebody just posted it in the chat session. Uh, if you want to attend, attend. I'm going to give you a lot of strategies, a lot of ideas on the webinar. And it's hosted by the Church of Pentecost. So I think we will save time on that for now. But yes, you can actually move from F1 to Green Car Street without going through H1B, OPT, and all those stuff. And I have a friend who, I, you see, I always tell people, there's no law in the US which prevents you from pursuing multiple green cars. I know somebody who is doing asylum. He's come to me, he's doing EB2. And yeah, I don't know what is going on with his own marriage based uh, green card. He's also trying something like that. And that's his own kind of business. People can pursue multiple green cars at a go. Because you want to double your channel. Like Doc said, Doc did even two types of uh, the EBs. Okay, so no law bars you from pursuing multiple green cars. And try, try, try very hard and do this. Especially people who also want to go into uh, teaching. There's a huge area in teaching that people are actually not looking at. Let me tell you something. I have a friend who did a PAD. Uh, he didn't complete his PAD at some point. He had to exit. But after that, he got enough data that he was awarded a master's. And after that, he got a very good school teaching in Texas, which is doing very well in that area. People underrate teaching a little bit. There are a lot of teachers who are needed in maths and STEM fields. Please don't only focus on corporate America. If you go into teaching, trust me, the H1B was just, I don't think his own took a lot of time, a long time to do that. And because he was in the education sector, it was fast track, it was very fast. Like Doug said, those are done capped. So you can actually file H1B for you anytime. And right now he is still in teaching and he's filing his own EB2 national interest waiver too. So consider teaching areas too in the US, though the salary will not be that six figures you want. Case at times may be disrespectful, but I tell people that see, having a status is better than no status. And having something coming into your account every month or every paycheck period is better than having nothing at all. And uh, one thing, one beautiful thing with green card is after that you get the luxury to do whatever you want. Because when I wouldn't have gone into immigration for a legal or study for it, because that is not what I came into the US on F12. USCIS will never allow that. I couldn't have gone working in healthcare because I've never done any healthcare related program. So, but after green card, like your American government don't care what you do with your life. So far, you don't get into crime, okay? And do something which better society. So please, please, and please again, uh, start planning. Start planning. Most of us, we are reactive. We wait until we are maxing out on our status, then we run a helter scatter trying to look for help. One thing is that even if you have to file on your own, don't submit it without a third eye looking at it for you, an objective eye looking at it. And Peter, because some of these things, people come to me, oh, I've done a whole lot of work and I think we have to move a whole lot of things around for them until it comes back to standard. Because if you get denied for national interest waiver, it's also very devastating. If you get RFE, it even throws you off balance. So thank God all the people have assisted. Nobody came back to me with RFEs because there are a lot of loopholes we will try to seal before I give you that green, green light to submit it. And Shelly best with me to that. They're like, oh, I want to submit it today. I say, wait, let's give ourselves two weeks and finish this touching area. And, and at the end, I think she did a very good job. And 
Of course, you are going to need recommendation letters. So your relationship with people, your relationship with uh, some people not, don't want to get their advices or their supervisor at work involved. That is fine. Good thing with EB2 National Interest River recommendation letters that you can collect from any part of the world, from Ghana, from Asia. If a USCIS likes it, when you spread it globally, I go one from Brazil, I go one from Belgium, I go another one from different countries. Okay. Wow, pretty awesome. That's a chunk of information there. And um, we have some few questions left to be addressed, but um, looking at our time, it is far gone. So I would want to plead with our panelists and the audience to spread us some few times to finish up the rest of the questions, then maybe address the questions from the audience too. So um, um, sorry, with Lydia. the last bit of the questions. Sorry, Lydia. Yes. yes. This is blessed. <clears throat> would you mind if we just take your questions and then wrap it up, please, because of the time? Okay. Yes, okay. so let's take That's the fine. people, yeah, the questions from the audience. Thank you. Okay. So I will start from those who raised their hands. I saw some of Techi, um, Doreen, then um, Abigail Leskin. I don't know. Your hand is no longer up. I don't know if your question has already been addressed, but if not, you can go ahead and ask your question. But for now, Doreen Samuel, you can go ahead and ask your question. Okay, thank you so much, panelists. Like I've I've have so many information in my head, I don't even know which one to use now. So I want to know it's based on um, job employment. So I want to know if it's advisable to go in or to apply for your dream jobs um right from the start, or in, in quotes to apply for jobs that you are overqualified for. Because I know, I mean, there's a quote that says um sometimes social work is the hustling that nobody wants to do, right? And some people in the beginning try to find stepping stones before they launch their perfect position or jobs. But is it so advisable to rise from the graduation, try to target like your dream jobs in quotes, or you can try to get some other ones, like especially with the PhDs, when they graduate, maybe they don't really land like a turner track position and maybe they go into teaching in community colleges. Is that advisable? Or you would want to advise that we try to target the very high ones that make us more qualified to get. Please, did you hear me? Yes. Um, uh, someone, okay, maybe then I'll just go for it. I think um, I, I used to also kind of think like that about um, should I do this should I wait and have this done at this time and and that's fine I think it's part of those people would like to think logically it's it's okay but the thing is that the world is not logical right it's not fair it's scattered right my advice would be this apply to your dream jobs apply to jobs that you're overqualified apply to all the opportunities you can now when you get a lot of options then you can take the luxury of like, okay, now, no, I don't like this, I don't like that. I, I remember back when I was coming to the US and I had a lot of schools like Massachusetts, Montana, South Dakota, Northern Arizona. It was better than, oh, maybe because I think, and definitely I even had a clone. There were some of them I knew that this, I'm overqualified, right? It doesn't hurt, like do all the opportunities. Then after, if you happen to hit your dream job, then it means you go for it, right? But you don't want to put yourself in a situation whereby, you're applying to only one cluster of opportunities because you think you're overqualified. Anything can happen in your favor or against your favor. So I would say go for all the opportunities as reasonable as possible, do your best. And then when you get a lot of different options, you choose from the one that you prefer most. Thank you, Mda. Okay, so Samuel, can you go ahead with your question too? Okay, so um, my question, my first question was with regards to um, the first session, which was mm -hmm. um, after school. So that question has to do with, um, normally when you are applying for certain job opportunities, they ask you um, if you need sponsorship, you know, you come across these questions, even during career fairs and stuff. But I know for a fact that we have the opportunity to do CPT, which I wouldn't need sponsorship for, right? We know we have the opportunity for OPT for three years or let's say a year. 
which he wouldn't need sponsorship for. But sometimes what we try to do is we try to get the opportunity to attend the interview and prove our worth to them. So in order for us to get the opportunity to be shortlisted, we end up saying, hey, I don't need sponsorship, right? In the course of the application. Is it right to do that or is it wrong to do that? So that is my first question that I wanted to ask initially. My second question has to do with um, um, the NIW. So it's about transitioning. You know, I have made a lot of inquiries about NIW because that is the only path I'm looking at. That is the only path I'm looking at. So I make a lot of inquiries of people who have already gone through it themselves and others who use lawyers and others who are in the process of doing it. So I ask, and then everyone tells me almost a different story. And I end up thinking, is it like an individual story-based application? Because someone tells me I need citations. Someone tells me even publication is not relevant. And all these people are people who have also applied and then they got acceptance, right? So um, do you really, I know we've talked, we spoke about these things. Do you really need publications and citations as just supporting documents or you really need it to boost your chance of getting acceptance for your application? And also um, for OPT, the timeline, can you apply um, for NIW when you are doing your OPT? Because I also spoke with someone who told me, normally the status, because of the status, you need to be very careful about um, the timeline you apply for NIW. Other than that, um, the, I think they said there is a particular status you have in OPT that contradicts with something in NIW. So sometimes, I know my, one of my professor's students, he is still in school. I mean, he has about over 10 publications. He should have graduated about a year ago. But he's an Iranian, but he says he has applied for NIW, so he's waiting. He's going to maintain his F1 or student status, and I don't get it. He's waiting. He, he, he's already been accepted for the NIW. He's waiting for the EB2, and he has to get it before he graduates. So these are things that contradict my understanding about the whole NIW process. And then since we have people who have already gone through the process over here, who are Ghanaians, who understand my language, I believe, uh, to be better to uh, explain certain things, to clarify certain things for most of okay. us here. Okay, so I'll try to be smart, uh, as fast as possible so that we don't eat too much time. Um, so first, I would, with regards to, um, will you now or in the future require uh, sponsorship? How you answer that? I think it depends on how you want to see it, right? If I were to answer that question on any day, I'm just going to choose no. I have a reason for choosing no, because I know that I have different paths I intend to uh, explore faithfully. So if, if that is that is not dependent on the organization, if that is your route, then you can say no, because truly you wouldn't need it. I'm, I'm doing things that I'm 100% sure that I won't need it. So there's no, you are not lying. But if you say that and you know you have no plans like that and you come back to them, you should be careful because some of the companies will, may deem that as being uh, not a honest person, right? So if you are doing that, you have to make sure that you are using it wisely. So that I think has been um, answered. Your second question had to do with um, citations. Um, I, I would say this, and I, I think I, I may have said this and Dan may have said this, um, but I would say this, like citation is not the only thing to show that somebody is a very scholarly person or is an exceptional person. Let me give you an example. Let's say that uh, Blessed has 159 citations, but all of those citations is because Blessed wrote a, 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 um, a review paper. Now, if you write a review literature paper, most likely a lot of people are going to cite you. There is nothing exceptional about that. That, that is, um, so even though Blessed would have a lot of citation, it doesn't mean Blessed is extraordinary, right? Two, it could even be that of this 150 citation that probably Doreen has, all of them, 80 of them are cited by his co-workers or his, or he, or even in self-citation. Like I've written a lot of paper and I've just recited myself, right? So I, I, I want to say this, that citation is not a bad thing and it is also not a good thing. It depends on how you will it as a tool to strengthen or do not strengthen. Like I said, I have zero citation. What does that mean? It means that nobody has used my work before, but I still proved to somebody that, see, I'm doing things that are really important and I'm showing my strength in these other ways. I have a friend in Arkansas 
who had no citation, who had no publication and no abstracts and still got NIW approved. How did this friend do it? The other strength, so that's what I'm saying, it depends on what you are, you are, you are yielding as a strength and or you are willing as a strength. But another thing I'll say this is that, um, um, Sam, uh, this might sound a little bit harsh, but that's the truth. Go through the USCIS websites. There is something called AAO um, decisions where they tell you some of the, um, the cases that have been denied and why they denied them. You'd realize that you can, some of them may have even 3,000 citations and they get denied, right? So if you, I read through those things, like I read through those things like two months so that I had knowledge of information about what I was going so that I wouldn't be swayed away. I contacted three lawyers and they all told me straight up that EB2 is no cut for me, talk of EB1, right? So it's all about like get the information in a way that it makes sense to you because there are information all over the place. Lawyers would want you to get citation because it's easy. If you have a lot of citation, they can easily explain to USCIS your work is important, but now you are just making their work easy for them, right? But it is not the only thing that guarantees you the approval. And as to, and, um, to your question about F, can you do F1? Um, can you do OPT with um, green card? Yes, I did it. Everything was fine. Dan also did his while he was at F1. You can do that in tandem. I believe um, um, Shelly also said she did hers while she was also in F1 status. So there is really nothing that prevents you from doing it at all. Just to add quickly, I did mine on OPT actually while I was on my STEM OPT. And like I mentioned, I did the concurrent application because um, I was working against my OPT expiration date, which would be June 30th this year. So that's why I even like quickly applied for both the NIW and Bank card at the same time. So you can definitely do it. Yeah. Mr. Kang, are you adding something? Uh, no, no. Okay. I'm, just, I'm just enjoying the information. <laughs> I mean, but, okay. but, but seriously, like, I'm so glad uh, I joined this uh, panel because the information mm -hmm. that me, myself, I'm taking, uh, because I now want to, I mean, I have my green card, but I would now want to empower people and tell people, hey, there are different avenues, right? I want to be that source of comfort to people. And this has given me so much information to share with people. So thank you. All right. Thank you too. So um, the last question, looking at the questions that was in the chat box, I could see a lot of it has been already addressed. But um, this one, the question is, with America being so much STEM driven, how can one get corporate industry jobs with a language program like for example, French, if one does not want to do academia. And I, I, I think, would, <laughs> yeah. I would beg to ahead. answer this because um, my wife is um, exactly. French <laughs> and then she's also been asking me those questions. Well, mm -hmm. no, she has green cards where so options are different. Um, okay. But what, what I would say is that, um, again, it depends on how you are selling the things you learned in French, right? Uh, can you sell the communication aspect of what you studied in languages? That can uh, be something like you can look at things like um, project manager and all. It, it all depends on how you are going to sell the things that you are learning from the French program to it, right? But that notwithstanding, I don't know if you've, like with languages, you've done a lot of things that are paying attention to linguistics and all of those things. What that means is that uh, we have computational linguistics, for example. That's a very big, big area. What, what, what do I mean by computational linguistics? Like, you know, you've heard of um, uh, Grammarly, right? You should know about Grammarly. Or even if you don't know about Grammarly, now you know about Grammarly. Um, there are also different things, like different sets of AIs that use, like, things regarding English language and then, like, data analytics, right? Now, you are already empowered with those aspects of the language where you pay attention to the lexicals and all those things, right? So now, if you're able to learn some aspect of this data analytics, you can easily be employed in such places because you can, like, even you can think about natural language processing, right? If you think, if you take up um, natural language processing, it's, um, it's an area whereby it deals more with 
paying attention to grouping of qualitative or categorical variables into making sense of data analytics, right? So now, if you already have that aspect of the languages learned, all you have to do is empower yourself with the data analytics part and then work in. So we even have forensic um, language scientists, right? So it depends on how you read wide about it and then employ the things you've done. But I, like I, I would say, nothing is useless. You may just have to empower yourself in some area to join with what you have and then um, work on it. And of course, if you don't want to do all these things, you can always be a teacher. It doesn't pay much, I assure you. No, no, except you. Except you are not in the business where investing. All right. Thank you so much. All too soon. Our time is up and I'd like to take this opportunity to thank all our panelists. We are so much grateful for being with us. We are so honored, like giving us such um, insights and a lot of information in a matter of some few hours. We are, we are so much grateful. And to our audience, as always, without you, Grasagno USA is nowhere. And we are always grateful for your support, always um, being with us. Anytime sessions like this are organized, you come out in your numbers to support us. We are so much grateful. And to our able executives, I know this work is tough, but as always, it's always end up so successful. So thank you to each and every one of us on board here. So now I'll call on Doreen. Doreen, yeah. To give thank that you, mm -hmm. answer, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for your time today. You started at 11 and 12 CT, 11 CT, 12 ET. And thank you for the panelists and from Dr. Neil Kine, Dr. Bat Nodro, Shirley to um, Mr. Baum. We thank you for your inputs and from the inputs also that came in the charts. And we look forward to having maybe another time in the year or to learn more about everybody's experience in the United States. We know you've come from a different country. We are trying to all find our feet here. And so we have a few announcements. And so this is Grassack USA and we entreat all graduate students in the United States to be a member or be part of the union so we can keep it running with activities and also participate in it. And we have some few things we want to know. So the end of the um, tenure for the, this year's executives is coming to an end and we look forward to having a new batch of like, um, executives to help with running the union. So there's, there'll be elections and for, Currently, we are open to receiving applications for any roles, like a president, vice president, like a secretary, like maybe the publicity or the social media handling the post on our social media outlets. So please send in your um, applications. I'll put the link in the chat so that you can apply if you are interested. And also we have our, um, so this is the link to the um, application if you're interested in serving. And then it's important that we take part in service as we are here, because it all adds up to uh, CVs and how proactive we have been since we came into the country. Also, we have our Grassard Week celebration where we'll be looking at the real things that graduate students are going through. In a, I mean, it's part of the part of the uh, celebration, but the main thing is to learn from the research that all of us are doing in our various schools. And we'll have students present their research and we'll have awards given to them for the best research findings so far based on our own votes. So please let's look forward to um, information or announcements on our week celebration. In that, we'll be looking at how graduate students are dealing with mental stress as they are here, because it, take, I mean, it takes a toll on us and then we want to find ways to handling it and also making sure that we are still informed and studying and doing everything right. And then we also look forward to having a research conference also. Um, and that, I mean, the research conference where we'll be presenting our research findings, sorry. And also we entreat everyone to and follow us on our social media platforms and also visit our websites to see grassag.com to see if we have any news there. And if you're also interested in helping, but maybe not in any executive position, but helping in any way, you can contact any of us or you can even send a message to any of our LinkedIn or our Twitters or Instagram or Facebook. We are very active there. We look forward to receiving your messages. And finally, our fundraising. So as part of our research conference, we seek 
funds to help run the whole thing. And we are, our budget is about $4,000. And currently we've received some. Thank you so much for your donations. And we look forward to receiving more um, wholeheartedly from you and cheerfully. Please help us and be able to run our activities because we don't take any dues as part of the organization. So we seek, we always look up to donations from people to help. And we thank you for your presence today. And we look forward to having you during our next meeting or any of our activities that we have outlined. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doreen. In fact, because of our time, I was actually rushing things. I was supposed to take um, like the closing remarks and um, concluding remarks from our panelists, but because of time, I had to skip that. So um, at this juncture, I don't know if they can do it or you can just um, let it go. Bless it. Yes, um, Lydia, it's it's all right. I believe you're they can. Being the panelists, right? Sure. Yeah, so it's it's pretty fine. Um, thank you all once again for for being here and for sharing the information with us. I would like us to take a picture. So if we could all put our cameras on so that we can take just one picture, but then I'll remove the paint so that I can get a good um. Mm. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm yet to remove you. Just a second. Remove pin. Okay. So, please, I'll count up to three and then, don't you take the picture for me. Okay. You can snip it for me. Can you? Or I can even, let me just. Yes. Okay. So, one. Two, three. Let's all say cheese. <laughs> <laughs> all right, thanks so much. And that'll be all for today. Goodbye. Right. Bye, goodbye, everyone.